Okay. Um, so, for the next couple of lectures, we'll talk about um, continuous probability. Okay, so now you might be thinking that this is a course on discrete math, and you know, where does continuous probability come into this? Well, you know, this is Berkeley, we believe in diversity, and uh, you know, we, you know, it, it doesn't quite fit in, but that's fine. You know, we, that's that's the kind of people we are. So, okay. So, um, oops, something's the matter here. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, okay. So, what's what's continuous probability? So. You know, it's easier done with an example. So let's do it with an example. Right? So let's say that um, we are picking a point at random on a line. And let's say that um, you know, here's the line. There's 0. That's 1, 2, dot, 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 L. OK, so what we want to do is we want to pick a point uniformly at random between 0 and L, for some L. I think of L as 5 or 10, something like that. So it's some particular number. Okay? So, so now, you know, the way we describe this probability distribution is by is by saying this is what the distribution looks like. Okay? Um, Maybe what this height is going to be is 1 over L. OK, so this is the probability distribution that we're going to be picking up from. OK, so this function f of x, this is called the probability density function. Now, it's sort of very related to the probability distribution function we had before, but it's related. It's not the same thing. Okay, so for example, if you wanted to read, read out what's the probability that we picked the point 1, it's not f of 1. Okay, so we are picking a point at random. What's the chance we pick, pick 1? Okay, it's not f of 1. It's 0, right? Because... We are picking a point uniformly at random between 0 and L. It's, it's a real number, right? So we are picking, what, what we are picking is a random real number x between 0 and L. Okay, so the chance that x is any particular real number is 0 because there are infinitely many of them. Yeah? Okay. So, so this, this density function is not the probability of x. So what's the density function good for? Well, what the density function is good for is if you wanted to know what's the chance that the point you pick is between 1 and 2, then you would look at the area under the curve between 1 and 2. So for example, you know, if this is what you want to figure out, what's the chance that x lies between 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. This is the shaded area, and it's 1 over L. Yeah? So that's, that's, what the, that's what the probability density function does for you in, 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 in a continuous distribution. Yes? So it's, it's just going to be integral from 1 to 2 of f of x dx. In this case, this is equal to 1 over L. Right? And that's going to be true for any interval. You could, you could pick any interval from A to B, and you could ask, what's the probability X is between A and B? And you'd get the integral between, from, from A to B of F of X dx. OK, so now, what's the, you know, what's the condition that F of X must satisfy? 
Well, f must satisfy the condition that f of x must be greater than or equal to 0 for all x. Right? Because if it was negative, then you could find some interval. You know, if it, if it became negative anywhere, then you could find some interval where the probability of being in that interval is negative. And you, we can't have that with probabilities. Okay, so that's, that's the reason we have this condition. The second condition we must have is that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x equal to 1. That says that, you know, something happens always. Okay, so these are the two conditions that f must satisfy. In addition, it must satisfy some other condition saying that all these integrals exist, but, you know, we won't bother about that because it's, it's going to hold true about everything we speak about. So if you get further into probability theory, you have to worry about these kinds of conditions, and then you start learning about measure theory, and, you know, pretty soon you are too deep into it. Okay, so, you know, this sort of gets really hairy very soon, but, but we, don't, we don't have to worry about that. You know, ev all these objects will exist and so on, and so we won't even talk about that, that aspect of things. Okay, so is, is, it, clear? is it clear what, uh, what a probability density function is? So just to make sure it's clear, let me ask you a question and think about it for 30 seconds, okay? So, should I have added the condition that f of x must be less than or equal to 1? It's a probability. Density function. Maybe let's take another 30 seconds and you can consult your neighbors. No, just f of x is less than 1. You know, f is a probability density function. Must it be less than or equal to 1? OK. Um, Okay, so here, here's, the, here's the fact. F is just a probability density function. It doesn't have to be less than 1. For example, suppose that instead of this, suppose I picked, you know, I was going to pick a point uniformly at random between, say, 100 and 100.5. Okay, so I was going to pick this, this uh, a point at random here. So what would my density function look like? Well, it would, be, it would be zero everywhere outside this interval. And out here, it must integrate out to the area under the curve must be 1, right? So what must the height of this be? 2, right? So, the, so f is just, you know, it's, it, has, it has units of probability per unit interval, right? Locally, how, how much does probability in, increase per unit interval. So it can be anything. So for example, if you want, if you want to look at the, you know, if you want to uh, think about what a discrete probability distribution looks like, so say you had a probability distribution where, where you know, it was, um, you picked uniformly the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, each had probability 1 over 6. So this was what your probability distribution look like in the discrete case. Now, what would it look like as a continuous distribution? Well, if you really wanted to make it continuous, what you would do is 
you would say, well, not zero, but you know, I'm, I'm in the delta interval close to zero, and then my probability is what? It's, it's six over delta, right? You know, that's, how, that's how high f would be. And then, you know, what you would do is let delta tend to zero, and that's, you know, that's this hocus focus that physicists talk about, and then they call it a delta function. Right? So its height becomes infinity, its width becomes zero, and the area under the curve becomes whatever, one or one over six or some constant. Okay, so that's, that's okay. You know, if, if, if this only confused you, pretend the, we, I never said it. Okay? So, all right. Um, okay, but, but, but back, to, back to our picture. So our picture is this. Continuous probability distributions, we, we specify a probability density function. What are the conditions this density function must satisfy? Well, it's, it's, it's real, it's, it's non-negative, it integrates to one, right? Integral from minus infinity to infinity of this is, is one, okay? And we don't have to satisfy any condition like this. F can be anything, you know, as long as it's non-negative and it's the area under the curve from minus infinity to infinity is, is one, okay? So, so let's, oops, um, sorry. Um, okay, so, um, Let's, yes, sorry. I'm sorry? Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be continuous, but, but you know, there are, there are conditions about it has to be integrable and so on. And so we want, you know, all the, you know, all the F we look at will be continuous and it'll, they'll be nice there. Okay, they'll have nice properties. Okay, okay. so, um, so let's, let's talk about uh, uh, the expectation of this random variable x. Okay, so if x is given by this density function f, what's the expected value of f, x? So, you know, it's, it's sort of equivalent to what you would have in the discrete case, except you replace summations by integrals. So it's going to be integral minus infinity to infinity of x times f of x dx. Does this make sense? Right, it's completely the ana analog of what we did in the discrete case. So for example, in the case of, of uh, this example that we had where we, where we said we are uniform between zero and L, so our density function looks like that. It's 1 over L between 0 and L. This is f of x. So what's the expected value of, of, of x? Well, you can, you can sort of um, see that it should be exactly L over 2, right, just by a picture. But let's compute it and see that it really is, right? So it's, uh, it's integral from minus infinity to infinity of this. It's the same as integral from 0 to L of x times f of x is 1 over L dx, which is um, integral of x is x squared over 2 times 1 over L between 0 and L. So you get L squared over 2L minus 0. Right? It's, it's what you would expect it to be. Yeah? Sorry, I went through this in detail because I don't know how long it has been since you did integrals. Yeah? Okay. All right, so um, how about the variance of x? This is expected value of x squared 
minus expected value of x whole thing squared. Okay, so what's expected value of x squared? It's integral minus infinity to infinity. Well, okay, sorry, we don't need minus infinity because, you know, we had this nice distribution. So it's integral from 0 to L of x squared. F of x was 1 over L in the x, which is x cubed over 3 times 1 over L between 0 and L, which is L cubed over 3. No, L squared over 3. Yeah, L cubed over L. So what's variance of x? It's expectation of x squared, which is L squared over 3, minus expectation of x whole squared. So what was expectation of x? It was L over 2 whole squared, which is L squared times 1 over 3 minus 1 over 4, which is L squared over 12. Okay, so it's, it's proportional to L squared. You know, this is the square of the standard deviation, so the standard deviation is L over square root of 12. Now, where the square root 12 comes from, I, I don't know, you know, there is some intuition to it, but, but the important point is it's proportional to L, which is what you'd expect. Yeah? Okay. Is, is everyone happy with this? Yeah? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so, so now, I, I think I mentioned this problem, but I don't know if we went, went over it in class. This was this uh, problem called Buffon's needle problem. Named after a person, the Comte of Buffon, but uh, okay, so wh what's the problem? The problem is, is this. So you, you know, you, you, you have a floor, which is, you know, this wooden floor with these slats. So there are, there are lines on it. Okay, so there are, there are lines which are, which are unit distance apart. And you take a needle, which is also unit length, and you drop it on the floor. And when you drop it on the floor, it lands at a random place with a random orientation. So it's rotated in a random way. What you want to know is, what's the probability it intersects one of the lines? Okay, so, so you drop a needle, which is exactly unit length, but it's, it's, it's dropped in a random orientation like that. And now you want to know what's the chance that it intersected versus maybe it fit in, you know, it, it, it landed like this. What's the chance that it actually intersected? Okay, so you want to know what's the probability needle intersects a line, some line. <coughs> Okay, what's, what's the problem that the needle intersects some line? Okay, so, so now there are, there are two ways to solve this problem. One is just by applying the definitions, and the other is by being clever. Okay, each has its own advantages. If we apply the definition, then, you know, it's going to help us understand the, uh, the formalism of continuous random variables. So we are going to do that. And then, you know, there, there are advantages to be, being clever because you feel good afterwards, so we'll do that afterwards. <laughs> okay? Okay, so, so let, let's do it uh, by applying the, the, the formalism. So what, what we are going to do is, you know, okay, so, so here, here, here's our, you know, these are sort of the, you know, the lines what we're going to do, and these, this, this, they, are, they are unit distance apart. Now, where does the needle fall? So we're going to sort of pick a, the correct kind of convention for it, and then we'll define a probability space based on that, and then, you know, using that, you know, that'll be sort of a clever choice, and it'll allow us to, uh, you know, it'll allow us to, uh, to sort of uh, solve the problem. Okay, so... So let's say that these are the, you know, so I'll draw these, these dotted lines at 50%. So now what, what we are interested in knowing is, um, uh, 
you know, so, so I can specify where the needle fell by saying, well, you know, everything is similar. You know, these lines are, you know, there are, are infinitely many parallel lines. They are, they are one unit apart. I don't care which one the needle falls close to, right? It doesn't matter. So let, let me just pick the line that it falls closest to. So now it's either, it's, it's, it's within plus or minus a half of it. It's, it's either on this side or that side of it, within plus or minus a half. And I don't care which side it falls on. So I'll just say, you know, the way I'll, I'll decide where the needle falls is by saying, how far away, what's this distance y that it fell, the, the center point of the needle fell from the closest line? Okay, so y equal to distance of center of needle from the closest line. Okay? And then, having figured that out, now the only other thing that I have to do is figure out what, what the orientation of the needle is. Okay? So, so now I've got to figure out you know, how this needle sits. So, so the needle sits like this, let's say. And then what's interesting about the needle is what's this angle theta that it makes with the vert vertical? So angle theta with vertical. Okay. And I'm going to assume that theta is between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, right? Because, because I'm saying it can go either all the way like this or it can go all the way like that. And I'm assuming the orientation is sort of fixed. It's, you know, I don't want it, once I've fixed that, the, that it's, it's here, then I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the orientation as being fixed. So, so, so what I have is that y is uniform between zero and one half. And theta is uniform. I think in the, in the notes, you know, the, these lines are not one apart, but L apart. So, so just to be consistent with the notes, let's just make it L. So, so Y is uniform between zero and L over two. Theta is uniform between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay? Yes? Um, what do you mean by it? Meaning, it, you, you pick it uniformly in that interval. Sorry, yeah, but uniform. Um, you're right. Let me, let me just write it as... Uh, in the interval. Right? And... Yes? Okay, so, so this, is, this is a slight generalization of what we've been looking at so far, right? Because now we are saying, you know, okay, so let, let's look at it. So what are we saying? We are saying to pick where the needle lies, what, what, what we are saying is we must pick First of all, y, which is between 0 and L over 2. And we must also pick this is theta, and it lies between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. So what, what we are doing is we are picking a uniform point in this, in this rectangle. Right? That's, that's what it means to pick where the needle landed and how it was oriented. Okay? But probability you know, in two dimensions remains the same. So we have a probability density function f. So f is going to be a fun function of, of um, y and theta. And what's it going to be here? It's going to be completely uniform on this. Right? So, so it's going to be... 1 over pi times L over 2. So it's 2 over pi L. Right? 
as long as you're inside this rectangle and it's zero outside. Okay. And now if you have a little area like this and you want to know what's the probability that, that the needle was in, in one of these configurations, then you just look at the area under the curve. Right? So you look at the area under the surface there. So, so in other words, our probability density function looks like, looks like this, right? It's, it's constant. Right? Can you see if you can, you can imagine that, right? So, um, so this thing is coming out of the, you know, it's, it's sort of sitting up here. It's, its height is whatever it is, so that, so that the integral is exactly, its height is exactly 2 over pi L. The, the volume of this, of, this, uh, you know, of this box is exactly 1. And now if you have, if you have a little, surf, you know, little area like this and you want to know what's the, what's the chance that you fell in this, it's exactly the volume of the piece above it. Right? Yes? It's, it's, it's this, it's this height here, okay. right above the surface. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now what, what we, um, what we want to know is what's, let A be the event that needle intersects line. So then, what's the probability of A? Well, in order for, you know, in order for the needle to intersect the line, it must be the case that there's some tr trigonometry here, right? So, so how far, you know, what's, how far does this, this needle extend from here to here? You know, if one were to look at this vertical distance, how far down this needle extends, it has to be bigger than y. But how far does it extend? Right, so, so we are looking for, we are looking for this distance here. We, what we want to know is, if we were to drop a perpendicular, sorry, if we were to look at this perpendicular distance and we, if we were to say, how, how big is this length? Right, so sorry, let me, let me draw this again. So, so this is our picture, this, is, um, this angle is theta, this distance is, is, is y. And what we want to know is, did the needle intersect? Okay, so... So that's the needle. What we want to know is what's this distance? If we were to, if we were to look at this distance, what is that? Okay. And the answer is, well, this distance is L over 2. That angle is theta. So it's just L over 2 cosine theta. Right? So it intersects if and only if L over 2 cosine theta is bigger than y. Yeah? Does it make sense? Because, because I'm claiming the, the vertical distance that this needle extends is L over 2, which is its half of its length, times cosine theta. On the other hand, how far is the center from the line? It's y. So it's going to intersect if L over 2 cosine theta is bigger than y. Okay? Okay. So now all we need to do is figure out what's the probability that L over 2 cosine theta is bigger than y. Okay. So what's that? It's well, theta can be anything, so we want to take integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Y can be at most L over 2 cosine theta. 
So we must take integral from y going from 0 to L over 2 cosine theta. Yes? Of, of what? The density function. What's the density function? It was f of y theta dy d theta. Okay, that's what we, that's what we want. Yeah? Yeah, is everyone, is everyone with me so far? Okay. Now, okay, so let me, let me transfer all this on a new page and, you know, maybe I'll draw the picture again and we'll, we'll go through this thing. Yeah? Okay, so, so here was our picture again. This was the line. This is where the center landed. It was at a distance of this distance from here to here was y. This is what the needle looked like. Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the needle was symmetrical. It, um, and it extended till somewhere. So whatever it, it extended, however far it did, let's, let's make it extend till here. And then we said, this angle is theta. And so we said, this length, you know how far it extends, this length was equal to L over two cosine theta. And so we said, the probability of A is the probability y is less than or equal to L over 2 cosine theta. And so if we want to write out probability of A, we just integrate over theta and y less than this. So theta goes from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. y goes from 0 to L over 2 cosine theta. And now f of y theta was what? It was 2 over pi L, right? dy d theta. Remember, pi and L are both constants. 2 is a constant as well. So we could even pull all this out. So we'd get 2 over pi L integral minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. We can pull out d theta because we are just integrating with respect to y. And then we have integral 0 to L over 2 cosine theta of dy. Okay, so this, this integral we can do. Right? This we really know how to do. So this is 2 over pi L integral minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 we'll get, this is just L over 2 cosine theta, so we get L over 2 cosine theta, d theta. Okay, L over 2 cancels with this 2 and L. And now integral of cosine theta is sine theta. So we get 1 over pi sine theta going between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2. So we get just... No, what did we get? What did I do? Oh, sine theta at, uh, at this is sine of pi over 2 is 1, and sine of minus pi over 2 is minus 1, right? So you get you get 2 over pi. Yes? Is that okay? Sorry, this is a bit un unfamiliar, you know, uh, integrals and continuous, right? So, okay, let's make sure we're all on the same page. If it's, um, if it's any consolation to you, um, it's been a lot longer since I've done integrals than you have. Yes. 
2 over what? 2 over pi L. Oh, yeah. OK. So where did 2 over pi L come from? So it came from here. So remember, this, this length is L over 2. This distance from here to here is pi. And we are uniform inside of all that. So, so what, what do we want the height to be so that the volume of this is, is 1? Right? So we are picking the probability density function. So that, you know, and we want to pick it so that it's uniform. So we, so, so we, want, we want f of y theta to be some constant. And we want it such that integral minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, integral 0 to L over 2 of f of y theta, dy d theta equal to 1. Right? So now, if you want this to be a constant, what constant should it be? It's exactly this much. Yeah, that's where it came from. OK, so that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, the, that's the answer. This is the probability with which it intersects. And so if you wanted to estimate pi, you could, you know, you could sit around dropping needles all day and collecting statistics, and you'd get an approximation to 2 over pi. OK. okay. So, um, so that's one way of solving the problem. Now, it turns out that there's a really slick way of solving this problem, which involves linearity of expectations. Okay. Um, now, when I explain this, you know, OK, so sometimes, sometimes explaining these things is like explaining a joke. You know, it takes all the fun out of it. You know, it's, it's no longer funny after you explain it. So, okay, by, by the time I'm done explaining this slick way, you, you, you'll sort of be scratching your head thinking, this was supposed to be slick. I mean, you know, you spent uh, hours laboring over it, and then you call it slick, right? So, so the point is, at some point, um, you know, you, you know, if you, if, you, if you go through these steps and you'll be able to chain them through quickly and you'll see it all as one, one big blur and it'll all be there as one thought for you and then you'll say, oh my God, this is really slick. Okay, it's, uh, it's the same process of, uh, so, so, okay, I'm going to explain the joke to you. It's not going to be funny, but then if you go back and think about it, maybe you'll see why it was interesting. Okay, so, so here's, the, here's the way we are going to think about it. So, um, so we want to we wanted to know what's the probability of a, which is which is that the needle intersected the intersected a line. Okay, so we we had you know this was our situation and and there was a there was a needle and we wanted to know what's the probability of a. Okay, we can also talk about it in a different way. Let's let let's create a random variable x x equal to the number of intersections. And I claim that this is equal to 1 if it intersects, and 0 otherwise. Of course, there's this one case where the needle happened to be exactly oriented so that it intersected in both places. That has probability 0. We won't bother about it. If you really want to bother about it, think of it as, an, as a half open interval. So the needle has one end and the other end is empty. So it, uh, you know, it can't possibly intersect on both ends. OK, so, so just do whatever it takes to make it all work out. So, yeah. OK. All right, so, so that's the, you know, so, so now what's the expected value of x? Indicate a random variable. equal to the probability of A. Right? It's 1 if it intersects. What, what's probability it intersects? It's probability of A. 0 otherwise, so expected value is OK. All right, so, so now let's do one more thing. Let's, um, let's um, you know, we're, since, since we are talking about, about expected values, we may as well now start playing with what this needle looks like. So instead of a needle, we'll sort of create a shape which, which looks like anything we want. 
okay? And we'll call it a noodle, okay? It consists of just unit length segments that which we tack together, and maybe there are L different segments. And now we say, um, now we redefine X. So X is now number of intersections of this noodle with, with the lines. So now, of course, when we throw down the noodle at random, it can intersect many times. But we, we want, what's the expected number of intersections? Well, what's the expected number of intersections? Well, x is equal to x is equal to x1 plus x2 plus x sub l, where x sub i's are, does the, does, does the ith needle in this, in, this, in this chain intersect one of the lines, right? And so linearity of expectations is just l times, you know, it's, it's l times expected value of x1. Sorry, you know, maybe, maybe I should have chosen better notation. So let me, let me call this y, you know, just to not, uh, not have, X, you know, redefined. So let's say y was the number here. This was x. So y equal to x1 through xl. So, so y equal to l times expected value of x, right? x was the unit needle, you know, the, the chance of, this is L times the probability of A. Okay. Now, I claim that this is true also if these individual needles were not unit length, but if you made them smaller. Right? If you make it smaller, then, then the expected value of Y sort of becomes you know, whatever its length is. So, so it doesn't matter whether those, those individual needles were unit length or they were length uh, half or two or uh, you know, epsilon. This would, this would always hold. So, so you can sort of convince yourself that this is always going to be the case. So now, once you convince yourself that this is the case, and if you can let these individual needles be as small as you want, then you can create any shape that you want, including you know, ones that are curved. So, so the claim I, you, know, you, can, you can make is you can let this noodle really look like anything. And the expected number of intersections when you throw it down at random. So you're throwing it at random and randomly oriented. The expected number of in intersections is just the length of the noodle times the expected number of intersections for the unit length. Okay? So now, once you know this, you may as well pick a shape of this noodle so that you know the answer. So now, what shape should we pick this noodle to be in? so that we know what the expected number of intersections is. A circle, right? So we, we are going to pick this, this shape to be a circle of diameter exactly one. So now, no matter how we throw it, it intersects the line exactly twice. Yeah, if, it's, if it has diameter one, we have lines which are spaced one apart. We throw it down, we throw this circle down at random. How many times does it intersect the, a line? Exactly twice. So now we have expected value of y equal to two. It's always two. And this is the length of the noodle, which is what? Two pi? Is it? No, two pi. It's pi, sorry. Yes, it's pi. Okay, it's pi times the probability of A. Okay, so that's it. Probability of A is 2 over pi.
Um, should we take a quick break? No, what I'm saying is, okay, so, um, Okay, um, shall we, shall we uh, resume? So, um, you know, the only thing worse than saying a joke slowly is then having to explain it again. Okay, so, but since there were many questions, I'm going to try to do that. I'll, I'll try to explain to you uh, how it goes. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so here, here's what we were doing. We were saying, look, there's a problem that we are trying to solve, which is we are throwing a unit needle down in a random orientation on this, on this floor, which has, which has lines which are, which are distance one apart, and we want to know what's the probability it intersects. 
So that, that was the event we were calling A, and we wanted to know what's the probability of A. So the first thing we did is we said, you know, expectations are really nice. We know what to do with expectations. So let's first convert this into a problem about expectations. So what we know is that the needle either intersects a line or it doesn't. You know, it, inter it either has one intersection or zero intersections. So when you, when, you, when you want the probability of an event and, you know, where the event is either something happens or it doesn't, one way to write it is as, a, as the expected value of an indicator random variable. So you make a random variable x, which is 1 if it intersects the, the line and 0 if it doesn't. And now the expected value of x is just the probability of a. Right? OK. So, OK, now how does this help us compute the expected value of x or the probability of a? So now what we said is, what we're going to do is, let's say that we, we, we chain together a number of such segments. And so, so we had L such segments, so that the total length of the segments is L. And then, you know, it's some funny looking shape. It, the, the shape can be completely arbitrary. And then what we do is we just toss it at random on the, on the floor. And what we do is we count how many times does this shape intersect the lines on the floor? What's the number of intersections? So, we call that random variable y. And what we know is that y is x1 plus x2 plus so on up to xl, where x sub i is just the number of intersections of each such segment. And then we said, well, linearity of expectations, expected value of y is expected value of x1 plus x2, expected value of x2 plus so on. But the expected value of each x sub i is just the same as the expected value of x, which was the probability of a. So we just get L times the probability of A. OK. Then, then I said something else, which you know, maybe I should say more slowly, which is, now what if instead of a segment of length 1, a needle of length 1, you threw down a needle of length half? What's the probability that it in intersects? Exactly half of the probability of A. Right? Because you could, you could, I could, you know, instead of throwing down a needle of length half, I could just throw down a needle of length one and color half of it black, the other half white. I could say, I, I just want this first part, right? Okay, so either this part intersects or that part intersects. It's equally likely, so it's going to be half of whatever the probability was. You can do the same thing and make it epsilon, epsilon length. And then you can say, what's the chance that it intersects? It's epsilon times the probability of A. Right? Okay, so now instead of you know instead of making this this noodle out of out of unit length needles, I can make it out of needles of length epsilon. And still, I you know what I'll get is that the expected number of intersections is is L times the probability of A, where L is the total length of all these little needles put together. But now if I let epsilon tend to zero, then Instead of little straight line segments, I'll just have a continuous curve. Right? That's, that's what the noodle's going to look like. And so what, what we've shown now, hopefully convincingly, is that if I take any arbitrary shape, anything at all, and I throw it down at random on this floor, and I ask, what's the number of intersections of that shape with these straight lines, you know, uh, with, with the grid, with, with these, well, sorry, with these straight lines? then the expected number of such intersections is L times probability of A, where L is the length of this, this shape, and A, probability of A is just exactly what it was for a unit length needle. Right? Okay, so, so that's true no matter what the shape is. So now to solve this problem, we're going to be clever about picking the shape. We want to pick a shape so that we actually know what the expected value of y is. Okay? So what do we do? We, you know, these lines are drawn one unit apart. So what we do is we pick a, pick a circle of diameter exactly one. Okay? So, so take the circle of diameter one, throw it down. Right? So, okay. so maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's worth 
Okay, so if, if you have a circle of diameter exactly one, and these are exactly one apart, and you throw down this circle, no matter what, right, it'll always intersect twice. Even in the extreme case where, where the circle fits in just exactly, right, there are exactly two intersections, one on each side. Right, so it's always two. So why is always two in this case? If we chose this particular shape of this particular size, right? So now we said, what's the expected value of y? Well, it's two because it's always two, right? It's not, you know, the random variable is, com is just constant. It's always two. So the expected value is two. Okay, what's L? L is the circumference of this circle. Okay, so the circumference is pi times the diameter, so, so it's pi. So we have pi times the probability of A. Remember what was probability of A? It was the chance that if you threw down a needle of length one, that it intersected one of the lines. So pi times the probability of A equal to two. Right, so probability of A is two over pi. L segments. No, no, no. So, well, okay. Well, what I was saying, okay, so uh, if you had L segments of length 1, then the noodle would have length, length L. But later I just said, well, it doesn't matter. You know, you could put together any number of segments. As long as the total length is L, that's going to hold. Then the expected value of Y is L times probability of A. To, to length one, right? And then later we said you can subdivide them, you can make them small, you can, you know, all that matters is the total length of the segments. Yeah? Uh, can you explain why is y is two again? Why is, two? Oh, uh, why is this two? Yeah. Okay, why is two in the special case where we chose the shape like this? Right, so, so this, is, this is, you know, we've taken, you know, we've taken a shape which is unit, uh, diameter and it's a circle and remember where are we throwing it? We are throwing it on the ground and the ground has, is ruled with these lines which are unit length apart and now I'm claiming that no matter how the circle falls it's going to int intersect the line twice it's going to, you know, number of intersections is going to be exactly two Okay? Yeah, yeah should we go on? Okay, so um, um, let's talk about one other thing, which is independent random variables. So, Okay, so independent random variables, when you're talking about continuous probability, they work almost the same way as in the discrete case. So what we want is that the probability A is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to B, and C is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to D, is equal to the probability that A is less than or equal to X less than or equal to B, times probability C is less than or equal to Y, less than or equal to Z. Right? For all A, B, C, D. Right? That's, that's what we'd like. That's, that's how we want the, you know, that's what we want the definition to be. Um, and if you chase this through, and if you figure out what this, what this is saying, then this happens if and only if. Okay, so, so let, let's, let's say that, um, that you had a density function for, for the, for, you know, so, so you had f of, um, uh, uh, x, y, this is, the, this is the probability density function for, 
for, um, for, the, for the two variables together. But now, if you only watch x, right, you have a probability density function, which is f1 of x. And if you only watch y, you have a probability density function, which is f2 of y. Okay, does this make sense? So let me, let me sort of try to describe this to you in a picture. Okay, so, so here we had two variables, y and theta. So we had a density function which was f of y theta, right? It was a, it was a function of two variables. Okay. That, so so you, can, you can talk about both random variables together. Okay. Now, what if you are only watching one of the random variables, like y? What does the density function look like now? Well, what you would do is you would, you know, you're only watching this. You know, this other thing is happening randomly also, but you don't care. So if you wanted to know what's the density here, you would sort of integrate. You know, you'd say, well, I don't care. You know, I don't care what, what, what theta is. Theta is going to be a random variable. So I'll just pick theta at random and then, and then figure out what's the density here. Right? So you, you just integrate with respect to theta, and then you get a density function here. Similarly, if all you're watching is theta and you don't care about y, then you would integrate with respect to y and you'd get some density function there. So I'm calling this one f1, that one f2, and the whole thing is f. Okay. So it turns out that, that x and y are independent if and only if. f of x, y equal to f1, x times f2 of y. Okay? And this is sort of, you know, it's, it's sort of very easy to work out from this condition and, you know, letting b be a plus delta and d be c plus delta and letting delta tend to zero. And so, so you, you know, once you do that, you, you get this sort of falling out of that. Okay? So, so the main point is, you know, if you're dealing with continuous random variables, sort of many of the things that we did in the discrete case, sort of, you know, they have their analogs and everything sort of works out nicely. It's just a matter of doing integrals instead of summations, and that's, that's all you do. Okay, so um, in the time that remains, I just, I just want to tell you about, may, maybe, maybe right now I'll, I'll tell you about something um, without so many details, and then next time we'll do it with details. So you know, I'll give you the picture today, and then next time we'll, we'll see it in, you know, in real life. So it turns out that there are, you know, um, there are two major reasons to do continuous probability, okay? Which is, there are two probability distributions which are really fundamental, and they are continuous, okay? Um, actually, that's stretching the truth a little bit. There's one probability distribution which is really important. It's considered the most, prob most, most important probability distribution there is. So why don't I just cut to the chase and tell you about that one? And then next time we'll see the two because the other one is important too. Okay, so really the most important uh, probability distribution is the Gaussian distribution. It's also called sometimes a normal distribution. Okay, so if there's one distribution you were, you were going to learn about, this is the one you should learn about. Okay. Here's what it looks like. So it, it has two parameters, mu and sigma. Okay. And so f of x is e to the minus x minus mu whole squared divided by, is it sigma squared or two sigma squared? Two sigma squared. Okay, so. It's 
sort of looks like this, where there's some width parameter sigma associated with it. Okay, so usually what happens is, you know, normally you write out the probability density function. So this is the probability density function. Okay, so that's, that's x, you know, that's f of x, maybe that's zero. Okay, so it's centered at mu. So usually you write out the density function and then you calculate what the mean is and what the variance is. The normal, the Gaussian comes with the mean and variance already as parameters. So this is the density function for the Gaussian distribution with mean equal to mu, the average value, the expected value equal to mu. Okay, so the expected value of x equal to mu and the variance of x is sigma squared. Okay, we of course have to have to verify that these conditions are true by computing integrals, but but that's that's what you know that's what this uh, this distribution that's the condition it satisfies. Now, why would this be the most important probability distribution, bar none? Yes. Oh, there's a factor. Yes, I always forget these things. So let's see. It's, it's it has pi's in it somewhere, right? It's sigma, it's 1 over sigma square root 2 pi. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, so you have to normalize it so, you know, so that the integral is 1. And, okay, so, so now, you know, to, to know that this is a probability density function, we have to check a number of things. First, we have to check that the integral of this from minus infinity to infinity is one. The second thing we need to check is that these parameters are right. So if we actually integrate this times x dx from minus infinity to infinity, we get mu. So the mean is really mu. And if we integrate x squared times this, time, you know, and et cetera, and so on, we get sigma squared. Okay. So we can do all this. But now, why is this the most important distribution? You know, why should you care about this distribution? So here's the answer. Oops. Wait, what did I do? Okay. Um, I'm, okay. Maybe, maybe, okay. So since we are doing it without, uh, without calculations, let's do it like this. Okay. So here, okay, let's start with any old, any old probability distribution. So here are three examples of probability distributions. Okay, so those are the density functions. One of them is uniform. One of them is this funny double triangle thing where, you know, where the chance of being, being in this range is large and here it's large and in the middle it's very, very small. And the third one is this, is this kind of exponential, you know, which falls off exponentially like that. Okay, so now suppose we take two samples out of these, each of these distributions. So, so suppose we, for each of these distributions, we take two samples, and we take the average. And we ask, what's the probability distribution of that average? Okay? So here's what that looks like. So this is with two samples. Okay, so every, everyone clear what I'm doing? So what I'm doing is, you know, if you pick just one sample and you ask what's the distribution, well, that's what it was up there. But now if you take two samples, independently from, from, from the first distribution, and you take the average, the average of the two looks like that triangle. Okay, that's what the new distribution looks like. If you take two from this one, okay, why do, why do you get this, this large, why, why does it peak in the middle when you, when you take the average of two? Right? I mean, you have something which is, which is, which is zero in the middle. And then you take the average of two and you suddenly get this peak in the middle. So why would you do why would it look like that? Yeah. Yeah, so if you pick one from each side, right, that you, you would you would expect to be close to the middle. And you have a high chance of being on each side. And that's that's why you get this some kind of peaking in the middle. Here's what happens if you take five samples from each. Take the average. 
Isn't that great? It's amazing, right? And here's what happens when you take 30 samples. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it, it has an, it, this, this really does have an application in curving, you know, it, it, this, this is basically the, this, this is the basis of all statistics, you know, this is why this is the most important distribution, because you start with any distribution, and you take a few samples and take the average, this is where you always get to, okay, it doesn't matter where you start from. Do you want to see what's even more shocking? Okay, this is really, uh, this is really shocking. Oh, um, sorry, this was not what I meant to be doing. Sorry, what, what happened here? Um, let me see what, um, uh, oh no, um, maybe, okay, so could it be that, uh, Sorry, um, we had a slight um, problem here, so let me just see if I can, um, um, how are we doing on time? Let, let me see if I can pull this up, okay. Um, okay. Um, Ah. Mm. Sorry, we are not connected, so... Uh. Okay, so, sorry, I, I, I don't have that... Um, um, I don't seem to have access to it right now, so... But... Um, mm. Okay, so so let me let me let me just tell you what that um, you know what what I was going to uh, demonstrate to you, and I'll show you the pictures next time. So, what this you know what this other um, picture showed is, suppose instead of you know here what we are doing is we are starting from different distributions, and then taking several samples, right? So we are picking. In this case, we are picking two samples from the same parabolic distribution, and we are taking the average of those, and then we're taking five samples from that same distribution and averaging. And then when, by the time we take 30 samples, it's all over. You know, we are down to a Gaussian. Okay? But each time we are taking samples from the same distribution. Right? If we took five from this, or five from that, or five from that, or five from that. Right? There's one more demonstration you can do, where now you take five different distributions, you know, completely different from each other, except you make sure you match up two things. You match up the means, so you make sure all of them have the same mean, and make sure all of them have the same variance, okay? And now, you pick one sample from each one, okay? And take the average, and you look at what distribution you get. You still get the Gaussian distribution. Okay? So it, it, it doesn't matter that, it, you know, these samples are coming from the same distribution. They can all be coming from dis different distributions as long as they have the same mean, same variance. And you take the, take the average, you know, the pictures look exactly like this. You know, after five, you look pretty close, and after 30, you're, you're basically done. You know, it's all Gaussian. Right? So... So another way of saying why the Gaussian distribution is the most important is because, you know, as long as you're going to be averaging, everything looks like the Gaussian distribution. You know, this is why almost always when you're doing statistics, you know, you say, well, well, you, pick, you picked, um, 
you know, you pick samples, where do they come from? From the Gaussian distribution, right? You know, because everything comes from that. Okay, so.